Fiona had a weekend off. This was a rare event. You see, from Monday to Friday, Fiona would have her baby daughter, Emma. But then at the weekends, Emma's father, Sean, would take her to his mother's house where he was staying since he and Fiona split. So this would be the first time in ages 19-year-old Fiona would have some time to herself. She had organised meeting up with some friends in Tusker House Hotel in Ross Lair on the Friday night and also to meet up with some friends in her local pub Butler's on the Sunday night. A Friday night out, it's always good. Everyone's finished their week's work. It's the first night of the weekend. You can just let your hair down. Your time is your own. There's always a great atmosphere no matter which pub you go to. So Fiona and her friends meet in Tusker House Hotel in Ross Lair. And this night is exactly what Fiona needed. Just no hassle, among friends, simply just being and enjoying herself, having a few drinks. The only thing that didn't go great this night was that at one point, Sean, her ex, the father of Fiona's baby, walked in. Now, he didn't infringe. He kept to himself. He sat up at the bar drinking. He didn't seem to be planning on causing any trouble, but yet This made Fiona uncomfortable. However, she decided to ignore this fact as best she could, continuing with the banter and the crack. One of the men in the hotel that night was a Welsh lorry driver who was just stopping overnight. Fiona and this guy hit it off, just having a great laugh, getting along really well. So as he had to be up at the crack of dawn the next morning and he had just parked about 15 minutes down the road, Fiona went with him and sat into the cab where they continued chatting. But next thing, bang on the window. Sean was outside the truck, banging on the passenger side window and screaming at Fiona. Fiona had told her family that she felt Sean was watching her. She would see him parked close by to her place without any reason, things like that. But this was certainly rising it up a notch. After a while, Sean gave up and moved along. Now, this sounds scary, and it was, to the point where the guy Fiona was sitting in the truck with, the Welsh lorry driver, he didn't feel it was safe for Fiona to get out of the truck, so he started up the truck and he drove her home to her front door. The following day, Saturday, we don't know what Fiona got up to. She wasn't in touch with any of her family or friends, she hadn't made any plans to meet up with anyone. And remember, this was a time before social media, before mobile phones. We were not as contactable as we are now. Many houses didn't even have a house phone. And I don't believe Fiona had a house phone, which means you would need the exact change, money, coins, go find a telephone box and call whoever you wanted to contact from there. That is, of course, assuming the person you want to contact has a phone themselves and then They would need to be there at that precise moment to answer your call. It was not easy to contact people at the time. So unless you had prearranged plans, you would not speak with them. On the Sunday, Fiona had a prearranged meeting up with friends Nora, Joan and Martha in Fiona's local bar, Butler's. They would all meet there. A Sunday night is nice and relaxed. Everyone's gearing down, work in the morning. So they would just have a few drinks, but it was a nice quiet night. The only thing was Fiona's arm was really hurting her. She mentioned it a few times because it was really sore. She didn't mention, though, what had happened or how she had gotten hurt. Again, this night was going lovely. But again, Fiona's ex would walk in. Around 10 o'clock, Fiona used the phone in the bar to call home where she would speak with her sister and pleaded with her brother to come meet her. Now, he couldn't. He had to be up really early the next morning. And at the time, it was assumed Fiona was just trying to persuade him to come out for a pint. They wouldn't realise until later, after finding out lots more details, including medical records, that Fiona called because she was scared. She was looking for protection, not company. But they had no idea. Just as they had no idea, this would be the last night of Fiona's life. My name's Louise. This is A Drop in the Ocean, and let's dive in.
time for a disclaimer here and a content warning. We are talking about another case of domestic abuse here and I will be going into some details including medical records so if that's something that you'd rather not listen to or you feel might upset you please don't watch this episode. Look after yourself. I also need to say this is an open and therefore ongoing unsolved case. Everything I talk about here, all the information I give you, it's already out there in the public domain in bits and pieces. Again, as usual, all I have done is brought it all together to raise awareness and highlight Fiona's case. Regardless of what I talk about here or what details I give you, no action should be taken on the back of it. This case takes us to a small sleepy town in County Wexford, the southeast of Ireland. By the time Fiona Sinnott was 15 years old, she was larger than life. She had a strong personality. She was bubbly. She had a great sense of humour, loved playing pranks on people, but also had a much more sensitive side. She was compassionate. She would always make sure everyone was included in everything. And she already had a strong maternal instinct. All Fiona wanted was to have a family. She wanted children to be a mother. And she was really good with children. At 15 years old, she had little interest in every day going to school, but loved every day leaving school and spending time with her friends. So at age 15, Fiona left school to start working, looking for that independence already. It wasn't unusual for girls in particular to leave school in Ireland up until around this time, a little after. You might remember from this channel, Magdalen laundries weren't completely closed down yet. Mother and baby homes, which are a few episodes away, would be still going strong for a number of years. It was a highly misogynistic country where, let's face it, men could really do no wrong and women or girls were just not really relevant as long as they didn't cause trouble. Right or wrong, that's how it was. And we'll circle back to this, so keep this point in mind. So at age 15, Fiona would enter a relationship of sorts. This was not a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. This man she entered a relationship with was 27. At 15 years old, your brain is not even fully developed yet. You're still highly impressionable. Recent studies show that the brain isn't fully developed till you're 25. But at 15, even your body isn't fully developed. So for a 27-year-old man to be dating a 15-year-old girl or vice versa... It's wrong on so many levels. This wasn't a boyfriend and girlfriend. This was a man and a child. Society has become so much more aware of how inappropriate this is now. What kind of a relationship it really is. We all know the terms now. Grooming, predator. But back then, not so much. So this man, Sean Carroll, he rode a motorbike. Fiona saw this as him being a man of the world. She would scribble his name on her school books and was said to have been besotted. He would take her on bike rides outside of Wexford and Fiona just thought this was amazing. Fiona's family weren't happy about this, but Fiona was strong-headed and insisted she was happy. When Fiona was 17, she announced she was moving in with Sean, again to the great displeasure of her family. But again, Fiona thought this was what she wanted. This meant Fiona moving close to Exeter Town Centre, further away from her family. Things were not good in this relationship, as it would come out in no uncertain terms much later. Fiona was a victim of domestic abuse. The abuse included physical, emotional and psychological. As is all too often the case, Fiona would pretend to everyone that she was fine. Happy, in fact. Everything was great. But bruises don't lie. Not only that... But bubbly, friendly Fiona became withdrawn and cut off from her friends and her family. Eventually, she would confide in some of her family members. After much support and questioning, they knew something was wrong. It was now obvious. And Fiona confirmed that. Yes, he was assaulting her. Yes, he was forbidding her to meet up with friends or family. And yes, he was totally controlling every aspect of her life. But she was handling it. She could fix him, right? This is what abusers do to their chosen victims. Because some people believe abusers can't help it, that they lose control. But this is simply not true. 
They meticulously choose their victims, in fact often appearing to be extremely pleasant, calm, level-headed people to others, non-victims, showing they can, of course, control themselves. But Sean had Fiona convinced that this was her fault. If she could only do better, keep the place cleaner, love him more, not make him so angry, then he'd change. But here's the thing, they never do. Not without a lot of intense psychological help, years of help. You won't change them. And this behaviour escalates, generally. At least it tends to. At 18 years old, in 1996, Fiona found out she was pregnant. Now this thrilled Fiona. This was her dream. She had always wanted to be a mother. But Sean was not happy about this. He reportedly accused Fiona of getting pregnant on purpose to trap him. Fiona would be physically punished for being pregnant. Reports have found that partners who abuse pregnant women are often particularly more dangerous and more likely to kill their partners. But Fiona would prove how much she loved baby Emma, how responsible she was and just what a great mother she was by realising this was not an environment to raise a child in. She walked away from her abuser. From somewhere deep down inside her, she found the courage to leave. When she told him she was done, that she was leaving him, he was not happy. So Fiona compromised, agreeing to move not far away, to remain in his hometown. She found a place for herself and baby Emma. And at the weekends, Sean and his mother would take baby Emma, allowing Fiona to work. Then Monday mornings, baby Emma would be dropped back to Fiona. So that brings us up to this weekend, where on the Friday night, Sean was banging on the truck. By Sunday, Fiona had an injured arm and was at Butler's pub with her friends, calling her brother to come meet her, which he couldn't. Around midnight, five past twelve in Butler's, Fiona would decide it was time to leave. She promised her friends she would see them next weekend. She went to the bar and bought two packets of peanuts to munch on the way home, with the barman asking her would they see her the following weekend for the Valentine's disco, and Fiona saying yeah, definitely. She walked out the door. Sean followed just behind. Fiona was sober, the barman would say later. She had only had one or two drinks. At this stage, with Fiona having left Sean recently, With freedom now to make her own plans every Friday, she would meet with her family in a cafe for a coffee and a chat. The Friday following this weekend, Fiona didn't turn up to meet with her family. As I mentioned, people were fairly uncontactable at this time, so if someone didn't turn up without cancelling, not too much thought was given to it. However, the following week, when Fiona again didn't show up, her father went straight to the Garda station, the Irish police, and reported her missing. Initially, because of how law enforcement found Fiona's apartment, they thought Fiona may have just left of her own accord. Now, we know that wouldn't have been the case because baby Emma was Fiona's life. But law enforcement need to look at every angle. A lot of personal belongings of Fiona were missing from her apartment. Law enforcement did assess the situation, taking statements and investigating. They would speak with Sean, who told them that he had met up with Fiona at Butler's on Sunday night. He claimed Fiona had asked him to walk her home. He claimed Fiona had asked him to stay the night and that he slept on the three-foot sofa. Even though there was a spare bed, he claimed Fiona had a sore arm, which she was going to see the doctor about on the Monday. And she was going to get a lift, so he gave her three pounds to get a taxi with. And he claimed then his mother came and picked him up around 9am the following morning. So where was Fiona? And where was baby Emma? Emma would be routinely dropped back to Fiona every single Monday morning. So where was she this Monday morning? Why did Sean's mother come and pick him up, but not drop Emma off? A lot doesn't add up here, right? And why did none of them contact Fiona's family to say she's gone? Sean's mother never liked Fiona. She would not allow her through the door of her house even after giving birth to baby Emma. Do you think this is because she felt Fiona wasn't good enough for her, Sean? Or do you think perhaps it's because she knew this was a highly inappropriate relationship, but blamed the girl? Let me know in the comments. A lot of questions remained. 
Little Emma was 11 months old at this stage. Ten days after Fiona's father reported her as missing, Fiona's sister would have her 21st. Fiona did not attend. The following day would be baby Emma's first birthday. Her mother, Fiona, who had been preparing for this celebration, would not attend. This is when Fiona's family knew in their hearts something horrible had happened. A few months later, with no new information, law enforcement would drain the local lake, Ladies Island Lake. It took at least a month, with 24-7 floodlighting and a vigil by Fiona's family. Her father would stand there day in and day out, but no trace of Fiona was found. After this time, it came out that a local farmer had discovered black bin bags filled with rubbish in one of his fields. He believed it had been illegal dumping at the time. He looked in the bags and found documentation inside with Fiona Sinnott's full legal name on it. He burned the bags, only later hearing it in the media about Fiona's disappearance. He immediately contacted law enforcement, but the evidence, of course, was gone. He had found these bags around the time Fiona went missing. Law enforcement had already begun thinking that everything had just been set up to make it look like Fiona had run away. The information from this farmer solidified this thinking. Then also, a local from right beside where Fiona lived had noticed a whole line of full bin bags outside Fiona's home again around the time she went missing. Someone came forward through social media to Fiona's family to say that a person had come to them who was involved in Fiona's disappearance. It's believed they were involved in the hiding of Fiona's body. When pressed to report this, they said they couldn't, that only two other people knew the details that they knew. So if they were to come forward with any information, they would effectively be signing their own death warrant. Now, in 2001, this person would be found deceased in their vehicle. They had died of an overdose. Fiona's case would be upgraded to a murder inquiry in 2005. That same day, arrests would be made. The prime suspect, Sean, Sean's mother, Sean's sister, Sean's sister's boyfriend, Sean's ex-girlfriend and a male friend would all be arrested under Offences Against the State Act withholding information about a crime. But all would be released without charge. What other case have we recently covered that is similar to this? So similar it is bizarre. So with Fiona's case being upgraded to a murder inquiry, there were once again public calls for information regarding the case. A couple came forward with crucial information. On that night that Fiona left Butler's pub, the last night she was seen alive, this couple had been walking along the same route Fiona would have taken home with her ex. The couple heard a young girl screaming near Keisha Cross around 12.30am. Keisha Cross is approximately a 20 minute walk from Butler's pub and it is en route to Fiona's home. The reason this couple hadn't come forward at the time is because they were married but not to each other. So they didn't want to draw attention or expose their affair. And this is why public appeals, even decades after a crime, are really important. Because things change and people can come forward. Then in 2006, the media reported that missing Fiona Sinnott's ex-boyfriend, Sean Carroll, was found guilty of threatening to kill a man, Robert Pask, who is his cousin, and sentenced to three months imprisonment. In this article from the Irish Independent, it states, He said he went to the Garda station to make a complaint, but he didn't originally want to press charges. I just wanted someone to have a word with Mr. Carl to tell him to calm down. He agreed, meaning Mr. Pask, with Mr. Lanigan, solicitor, that everyone had been aware where Sean Carl had been for the previous two days. He had been in guard of custody in relation to another matter. Everyone in Ireland was aware of that. However, he appealed and he won his appeal, so he wouldn't actually spend any time in prison. Allegedly, Mr. Pask was acting voluntarily in withdrawing the allegations, but was not denying them. In 2015, information was given to Fiona's family through social media from a person stating that Fiona's ex-boyfriend, Sean, and his father were working on a house next door to this person. So it would have been a convenient place to dispose of a body or any other evidence. 
This person had informed law enforcement twice prior to contacting Fiona's Facebook page, which is run by Fiona's cousin Gina, who was really close to Fiona. But for whatever reasons, law enforcement didn't or couldn't act on this information. So Fiona's family did. They searched this location themselves using cadaver dogs from Operation Trace and they were focused on finding a septic tank in particular. Once they did, they hired a digger. When access to this septic tank was gained, I heard Gina talking about how she watched her uncle climb down this septic tank to search for Fiona himself. They searched this site for over two months, but unfortunately they didn't find anything. And now they're afraid that they just weren't experienced enough or didn't have the skills to properly search the site for human remains. Needless to say, this whole search was deeply traumatic for all involved. In 2017, at age 47, after battling a short illness, Fiona's oldest sister, Caroline, died. And this brings us to Fiona's medical records, which tell a horrible, sad story. Fiona's family gained access to her medical records only in 2018, when they were gathering information for a documentary that was aired on Virgin Media. It was called Missing Fiona Sinnott True Lives. These medical records showed that from the age of 15, Fiona Sinnott was being physically abused. Now remember, Fiona had eventually confided in her family that she was being abused physically and emotionally. But looking at the medical records, Fiona's family realised that they didn't know the half of it. Fiona hadn't just been assaulted. She had been tortured. And that's my words, not theirs. She had regularly been beaten, pushed down the stairs, at eight months pregnant, fracturing her foot. She was kicked in the head and she was bitten. Yes, bitten. On her legs, on her face. And this didn't just happen once or twice. She was a regular at the hospital, to the point where the medical staff knew her on first name basis. They knew her. They had pleaded with her to press charges against her. Name was redacted, but she only had one partner in her short life. And she wouldn't report him, as we see all too often in these situations. She didn't want him to get in trouble. And this girl had been the victim of horrific domestic violence and then disappeared. Another sad, sad thing they learned from these records was a specific date of an admission to the hospital. Fiona's cousin Gina. She and Fiona were really close. They were about the same age, just five months apart. But Fiona didn't show up for Gina's 18th birthday. This was an important milestone that of course Gina knew. She just knew Fiona would attend. But she didn't. And looking at the medical records told Gina why. The night before Gina's 18th birthday. Fiona had yet again been admitted to hospital. Fiona had never told Gina this is why she wasn't there. Everyone knows who is responsible for Fiona Sinnott's murder. Fiona's father, Pat, died age 59 in 2004, they say, of a broken heart. On his deathbed, he told his brothers to never give up, to stay looking for Fiona and to find her. And that is exactly what the whole Sinnott family have continued to try to do. They have not given up. So what happened to baby Emma? Baby Emma was 11 months old when her mother was murdered. We see it every time in these crimes. There is never just one victim. Baby Emma was also a victim of this crime. Her mother was taken from her. A mother who loved her more than life itself. Whoever did this, whoever murdered Fiona, also did this to Emma. We can only hope Emma grew up happy and safe. She was raised by her father or her father's family. Fiona's family did try to get custody of baby Emma following Fiona's disappearance, but they lost to her father. They had visitation with Emma from time to time following this, but so much time would pass between each visitation that little Emma, she didn't know them and this would stress her out and upset her. She was afraid. So out of love for Emma and what was best for her, they had to stop the visitation heartbreakingly. But that's what real love looks like. Baby Emma would now be in her 20s. If you happen to know something about this crime, please say something. Fiona was not the only victim of this crime. 
So was her daughter Emma and so was every member of Fiona's family and her friends. And that concludes today's case. Hopefully someone's going to come forward. We know there's at least two more people with details that have never come forward. Okay, if you've made it this far, thank you. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it so much. I'll see you shortly for the last episode of Ireland's Vanishing Triangle. We will then have a concluding episode where I delve into the beast from Bolton Glass, Larry Murphy, and tie everything together. And then I will be covering the mother and baby homes as promised. Thank you so much. Take care of yourselves and each other. Good luck and bye bye.